All right. So I'm applying I, or I'm uh, submitting to this transplant visionaries challenge. And I realized it would be useful to have a recording. This makes it a bit more dynamic and it um, would also be good for you guys to later on interrogate me. Anyway, the title, Xeno Transplantation Machine Creativity Reverse Engineering Histology in Three Living Dimensions and the post-scarcity future of transplantation. So you may not have thought about it that way, but transplantation is a very successful medical procedure, but many people who might want it, wait for it and never receive it. So for many years, we had been providing organs to about 10% of the patients who would require them for end-stage uh, disease. And during COVID, it dropped to 5%. Um, so, it, so it really is a kind of scarcity mindset, uh, you know, people thinking, how can we increase to anywhere close to the number of organs of the number of people on the waiting list? On the other hand, there are three technologies that could, in theory, provide organs for everyone. So they are xenotransplantation, and at the moment that seems to be pig to human transplants, regenerative medicine like stem cell generated organs, and bioartificial organs, which is usually a combination of like a silicone filter and then some cells put together in some sort of complex. But none of these three technologies are working yet as of today. So you, it may seem that we're close to pig to human transplants working, but we really don't have the proof that the technology is, is going to work. But people are already starting to plan for it. And so at the just concluded Banff transplant pathology meeting, we talked about what a classification would look like for xenotransplanted organs, new BAMP classification for xenotransplantation pathology. So these three technologies that could provide organs to everyone in theory are not working currently. Something that is working though, <laughs> is something kind of related. And then we're talking about machine learning and precision medicine approaches, for instance, the Xeno transplantation. And within that realm, artificial intelligence large language models are working surprisingly well. I mean, they're able to do more by far than, than was, was expected. Um, and so what this has meant there are these human beings who enjoy making predictions, get trained in doing predictions. They work for a company called Metaculus and Metaculus has been tracking when artificial general intelligence is going to exist. And they had felt in the past, it was around somewhere in the high 2050s, 2057, and in May of this year, that predicted year when artificial general intelligence machines as smart as we are would, would exist, plummeted, fell quickly from 2057 to 2039. And one presumes that it will come down further. So suddenly AGI, Artificial general intelligence seems like something in all of our lifetimes. It's something we will experience, something that may exist within 15 years. And how does this apply to pathology? Well, 
it's interesting that there aren't very many art articles about large language models in pathology, but there are some. Who knew? So there's something called pathology BERT, which is a new transformer language model for the pathology domain. And I have references there about that. And so in theory then, you could imagine doing the, the opposite of one thing, what one thinks about now. Um, so you 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 would think of like scanning slides and, and then getting a digital um, image of of uh, histopathology, but in theory, just as with these large language models, you can just put in a text prompt. In the future, you could put in a text prompt and get histology, get you know, something that looks like a microscopic section of an organ, a transplanted kidney or something else. And these technologies would eventually probably allow um, for sufficient fidelity. So you first you'd have just 2D models then you'd have 3D, like what happens when you have serial sections and you produce a 3D histologic model. And then it would have the fidelity that would allow you to use that in information to program a 3D bioprinter and actually print organs or parts, parts of organs anyway, from data, right? It, it's something that, that we really had never thought about before this, this year is that you could input text and data and have um, living tissue coming out of the other end. How, how about that? That kind of brings all those things together. You could imagine that uh, you could start with data from a, a pig kidney, for instance, pig to human transplant, and then that could inform the 3D printer to, to create uh, tissue based on that model. So it kind of brings together these three uh, technologies, all of which could move us from a scarcity world to a post scarcity world where there might be enough organs for everyone. So that, that's exciting. So if you think about a competition with, with the name Transplant Visionaries Challenge, doesn't it sound like it's a big challenge? It wouldn't just be a little incremental change, but a big change, right? And so going from scarcity mindset to a post-scarcity mindset, would be that kind of big change. So you might say, well, how do we fit in? <laughs> you think, where do we fit in? Well, you're taking a course, Technology and Future Medicine Lab MP590. I've been teaching that course for 11 years. A lot of my professional activities ultimately come from the course, and this is no, no exception to that. And as a part of this challenge, if we're one of the finalists, we have to create a short video. <laughs> and you can imagine, I was quite enthusiastic about that because having created 1500 other videos, I kind of confident about how we could do with our short video. I, I think it's a three to five minute video for the final face-to-face -face, uh, competition between the five finalists if, if we end up in that. Yeah, and, and one of the best videos I've ever done is a one minute video. It, it was done for a one minute video challenge. And it's about how you can live a Star Trek life through mind uploading and genetic engineering. 
It's a bit jarring in terms of all the different changes it suggests you might have to make to do that because the radiation, I mean, when you look at Star Trek um, episodes, to actually do that, you have to deal with the radiation risk, which is really huge. So somehow you either have to genetically alter the human or create huge shielding or something like that, or mind uploading, <laughs> that's, that's really good. Then you have no biological body that you have to protect, right? So, um, and a lot of the things, the, the kind of unusual things we've done in the course we, we are really interested. You'll find that one minute video living in a Star Trek world um, talks about the possibility of multiple instances of self. And so we have many videos and, and teaching sessions around that. And um, two ye years ago, the students became interested in getting life-size cutouts of themselves so most of them did that, made out of coroplast, which is the usual material for doing such things. Why isn't it cardboard? Because cardboard is for mass production. If you're doing cutouts of students, you're not gonna make millions of them, you're just gonna make a few. So that's what you use coroplast for. And you may know that throughout the pandemic, I've had in my office these 17 cutouts of them of the students. So the rest of you were really lonely, but my office was quite crowded with, with people. Uh, yeah, how, how about that? So um, now you, it might seem like these things are completely impractical and not, nothing would be happening with them, but exactly the opposite is, is true. There is the uh, finals for the a and a Avatar X Prize occurring a few days from now, November 4th and 5th at the Long Beach Convention Center. It's, I think the top prize is uh, $10 million. And I've, I've been following this for, for a long time and it's nice to see it coming to fruition. It makes all our videos about multiple instances of self um, rational and reasonable one, once that competition actually takes place. So um, I've um, had, had an interest in sort of human cooperation for a long time. When I came to Canada as chair here in uh, pathology in 1987, I became aware that the pathology leaders in Canada didn't have anything to do with politicians, no interface whatsoever. And it seemed to me they were gonna be written out of the will as things went on because politicians didn't know them and would not factor them into any plans. So I founded something called the Future Pathology Laboratory Medicine in Canada Consortium. And actually a lot of the later consensus things that I, that I did, like the Banff classification were sort of based on that. We met in Mississauga, which is not quite as romantic as Banff, but anyway, that's where we met all the sort of, you know, pathology leaders decided what we wanted from the uh, politicians and so on. And in 2022, I've re-embraced this idea of human cooperation and how AI could help us with it. And on August 5th, I did an AI seminar um, on this subject. And uh, I was afraid no one would come. So a bunch of students like you were all prepped to ask me questions because there's nothing worse than giving a talk and nobody asks questions. But Rich Sutton, Sutton was there the best known AI guy here in the city. And so he asked me questions. It was, it was uh, pretty cool. And we're, we're, we're continuing to pursue this uh, project in, including through a uh, 
grant that, that we wrote and uh, submitted last month, September. Yeah, and it, at the 20, 30th anniversary Banff meeting um, held September 19th to the 23rd, we sort of visioned what this future classification of xenograph uh, pathology would look like. Um, all right. And um, I, I had previously written a paper about what Banff classification of tissue engineering pathology would look like. Okay, so then in here, there's this question. Uh, yeah, so anyway, you have draft models of what these two different new Banff classifications would look like uh, influenced by these technologies that would move us from a scarcity to a post-scarcity mindset. One of the questions in this uh, submission, uh, how has your program been innovative and improved a measurable outcome of transplantation? <laughs> Maybe the shortest answer ever to that question. Our proposal moves transplantation from a scarcity mindset where it has always been to a post-scarcity mindset for the first time ever. Yeah. So, and what about this post-scarcity mindset? Is there any evidence for that? Is it just fantasy, you know? Is like there's nothing to it or... Well, actually, we're starting to see something like that. And the reason has to do with uh, DALI, this large language model from OpenAI that produces graphics from text prompts. And if you just think of like the worldwide interest in something like that, originally, it was really hard to become a uh, beta user. Back in uh, uh, July, um, I had to submit my uh, Instagram URL and uh, most people my age, <laughs> would be, their application would have died at that point because they have an old and tired Instagram account. But as you may know, my, my Instagram account is, is run by a 26-year-old singer, Mallory Chipman. So yeah, anyway, so I, I was accepted. But for a long time, most people were not able to use um, DALI. There are other less powerful programs that were able to use. But all that changed. There were many rules surrounding uh, DALI. They began allowing the uploading and editing of photo photos of faces. Um, so like you can create all sorts of images of yourself and different uh, outfits and that sort of thing, which you had not been able to do before. So on September 19th and on September 28th, they removed the wait list. So people could directly register and start using the program right away. And so as a result, people with relatively little experience using Dolly started sending emails with lots of Dolly attachments. And uh, some of the recipients complained to their email providers because the problem here is really one of post scarcity where you're getting so many good images that if you could send them to your friends, wouldn't just send three or four, but maybe try to send 30 or 40 or whatever, you know, way more than your friends want and way more than the mail system can really cope with. So the uh, email providers decided we have to do something. And so for five days, they put in filtering. So even a small Dolly attachment couldn't be sent the way usual attachments were and would have to be sent using uh, Google Drive or, or, or some such mechanism like you would use for something that's beyond the usual 25 megabyte attachment limit. There were also lots of, of cases where if you had an old computer, the computer ran out of virtual 
memory when you were using Dali because it, it, it's so memory intensive. But of course, during that time, the users became more experienced creating and sending Dolly files. And by February 14, uh, sorry, October 14th, um, it became clear that special handling of Dolly attachments was no longer required. And by the 17th, everything was back to normal. But during that five day period, at least it was a little bit like a post scarcity world in that the world was reacting to this fact that people had many more beautiful, surprising images than they ever thought and could send more to friends and the friends never expected to get so many attachments and all, all that kind of thing. So for a brief shining moment, we were living in a post-scarcity world from October 10th to the 14th. It was kind of nice to see that happening. There are other aspects of post scarcity, if you just think about how you feel and what it's like to be entering the text prompts and seeing the four images. So it takes only 10 seconds to get the four images back from your prompt. And you can use the same prompt over and over. So you don't have to do much thinking. If, if you like what's happening, you can select the ones you you like and go on and use the same prompt again. Um, and it, it's kind of uh, habit forming or, or you know, mesmerizing, whatever you want to say. Um, and I, I think that effect where people wanted to do more and more of it has nothing to do with glimpses of future artificial general intelligence. I mean, that's that's not what was so habit forming. It was that you, you never thought you would be able to produce so many beautiful images and, and uh, you know, of, 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 uh, there, were, there were rules, but still given those rules, it was amazing what you could uh, produce. Um, so the images are initially free, but even at high volume, they're cheap enough that most people could, could afford to keep generating as many images as, as they wish. Uh, and, and the images get better and better as your skill at, at developing the prompt craft increases. Each image is unique and you're regarded as the creator, you can sell it, so on, just, just as if you had independently created it your, your, yourself, as long as you give credit to Dali. So we need to evaluate what extent this gives a sense of what AGI will be like. And I think that that's something I want, want to talk about a little bit later. How profound are the insights that you get from Dali? I think up until now, they're fun and interesting, but they're not as profound as what an independent intelligence smarter than you are could actually create. So they, 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 they aren't really there yet. And compared to science fiction, like the best science fiction of today, probably it gives you better ability to predict what the future is going to be like than these uh, uh, Dolly images do. Okay, moving on. Yeah. So yeah. Anyway. Um, I'm, I'm now going to go on with a PowerPoint. Any urgent questions at this point? Um,
Yeah, so Dolly and kidney pathology, machine fantasies give hint about what artificial general intelligence will be like. So this is that uh, metaculous graph I was talking about early in, earlier. And you see that this is May, 2022. And you can see that the predictions had all been up here in the high 2050s came down to 2039, to some extent gone down below that. Yeah. So I guess maybe the other thing you could ask yourself is how mundane and sort of what everybody's talking about is <laughs> what I'm telling you. You know, like, is there anything unique about my ideas and this is, or is what I'm telling you what everybody thinks? And I think what we can be quite proud of is how much of a minority Rich Sutton and I are. So um, there have been these, these are the only articles in print that formally critique our. AI work in this area. And they're very gentle to us. You know, the worst they call me is quixotic, <laughs> which means sort of Don Quixote like, right? And I guess that must be true because when you come to my, my office, <laughs> the first pictures you see is a Don, Don Quixote picture. So, I mean, it's yeah, that's not a bad word to use. But otherwise, what they're really saying is, why are there only two people talking about positive outcomes of artificial general intelligence? And everybody else is talking about AGI doom and how it's going to kill us all and nobody's doing anything about it. So I, I think that even if Rich Sutton and I are wrong, it's still a worthy subject for you guys to hear about because we're in the definite minority and somebody's going to be working on the possibility that the outcome of AGI could be remarkably positive, creating a world much better than you ever imagined, as opposed to a world much worse. So I think that that's, that's why it, it's listening to, worth listening to. Yeah. Um, so, the, the, these are the same slides, many of them, that I, I presented on September 9th. And so I'm not going to go through them all. Um, just pointing out, I've become very deferential to um, Dali. You may also have noticed as students, I'm very uh, you know, deferential to you, right? If you want something or need something, I'm very likely to be willing to see if we can't do it. Well, similarly, when Dali wants something, like if I'm doing a, a, um, a text prompt and it doesn't like the words in the prompt, I'm very much into changing the words until I get something that, uh, you know, Dali will like. So for instance, you cannot search for pig to human transplants because that phrase seems like some sort of insult. Whereas you can say porcine to human transplants and, and Dolly will like that just fine. So that's, that's what I have begun saying. Yeah, and, and like even in the first day that I had it, I was trying to get, um, images for these challenge, these big challenges of, of the human race that AI could help with. So we already had images for the first 12. Uh, I was looking for ones uh, for challenges 13 through 24. And one of those was uh, genetic degeneration. And Dolly told me if I search for that again, it would kick me off, off the program. And actually, of course, Dolly's right. If you look at that phrase, it, it's a phrase used by a lot of people who have a background of you know, thinking that is uh, um, uh, somewhat biased. So anyway, 
I, I change the genetic degeneration to genetic engineering and Dolly was happy and I, and I was happy. Yeah. So I won't go into many de details of this. We, we, we have, we've worked recently on two different grants and between them we have the total team of 28 people, sort of a team in waiting. <laughs> but yeah, they're, they're, they're really uh, a very diverse and, and cool group of people and students. These are some of the students. Yeah, so now I think one way to judge people, like that this is a little bit of a humorous remark, but you may not have thought about life this way, is on that person's YouTube videos, what's the maximum number of thumbs up? And for me, that number is 14. And the video that got me 14 thumbs up is right here. So, so the one about uh, AGI ruin and list of lethalities and the possibility that rather than being terribly negative that the outcome of AGI could be very positive. That had the 13 thumbs up. Rich Sutton, on the other hand, regularly his videos have, have uh, thumbs up in, in the high 30s. Yeah. So anyway, I, I don't know if you've ever thought of that. Okay. So yeah, John, one of the things you may be thinking about um, is how unfair to artists um, Dali is, where you could just take an existing artist, like steal all their stuff, right? And that actually isn't true. And I'm, I'm gonna tell you a story about that. And it sort of begins with John Davis, who was the CEO of the National Kidney Foundation for a very long time, during which uh, he, he was my boss in something called NKF Cyber Nephrology. But think of his life versus mine. He's running an organization uh, that affects millions of people and has many thousands of, of employees. And uh, yeah, we, we were working quite closely together. And we, we, we were looking forward to a pivotal meeting at Microsoft. He was dreaming about it. I was dreaming about it. We were gonna go there, make our pitch. Yeah. But we were independent enough that I didn't know what slides he was showing and he didn't know what slides I was showing. And so right before we, we went, he sort of shared that. And it was a low moment. And that I, I I didn't much like his slides, and he really didn't like my slides. Um, yeah. So so the other thing is we hadn't factored in lunch, and the meeting with Microsoft was right a, after the lunch hour. So he and I arrived starving, having nothing to eat, with in, incompatible slideshows. It, it, it was very interesting. Well, how did that happen? It's all about the art created by this artist, Philippe Hebert. And there used to be a, a, a program on, on the web run by artists with no middle man. So it's direct compensation paid to artists without any large company in the way, rebelart.com. And I became aware of his art through this program. And uh, so I, I fell in love with his art and I'll show, show you what it's like. You already may have seen it on, on our uh, website, justmachines.com and uh, bought all his stuff and you know commissioned him to make more, yeah. Um, so we did all that and then we, phys we physically met in Montreal. He li lived in a Montreal suburb. So he rides his bike in, into where we were staying at, 
and and we meet and he, he has a message for me that's quite shocking which is that since i'm the only one buying this kind of art he has changed to doing a completely different kind of art that um, entities with really deep pockets seem to like and he's never going back to the kind of art that i love so much so let me just show you that that art it's kind of rebellious art because when lines meet they don't just meet they go beyond the meeting point and create these little spicules everywhere and so maybe subconsciously you're not really aware of why it is that you really don't like this art or do like this art but if you're running a very large organization, it's important for people to conform. So you don't like people breaking the rules and something in your subconscious tells you that this art breaks the rules because you've got all these spicules everywhere where they shouldn't be. And yeah, so I, I think it's something about my rebellious nature that may me <laughs> like this art and something about the fact that um uh that the ceo of the national kidney foundation was running a really large organization that made him hate the art so <laughs> these are some of the pictures planned now this one is is important in terms of thinking about defects in what dali does so here clearly you can see the computer is offering a cup of coffee to the person using the computer that's very clear to you but as you'll see later on in this presentation if you ask dali to make a picture like this to give you a variation on this it cannot do it it can only show you things where the coffee cup is being held by the human user of the of the computer, um, and so you you can see that here. These are all the various variations in that. There's another image showing a third arm, and this is you know Dolly's attempt. It, uh, it it's also able not able to produce a third arm. So a lot of sort of conceptual things having to do re with relationships between the different parts of an image and what comes first, that Dolly 2, the current version of Dolly, cannot handle. And if you think of the way that uh, anatomical pathology works, you know, the, you've got various structures in a slide of, of, of a kidney or some other organ, you know, tubules, glomeruli, vessels, interstitium, they have some sort of relationship to each other, this kind of continuity and paths. So Dolly is not currently able to do that at all. Um, and so like it can never get the third arm, it can never get the computer holding the coffee cup. And that means that if we were stuck with the current version of Dali, we could never produce histologic images using that program. But you realize we won't be stuck with that because artists everywhere are aware of these limitations that the program has now. And open AI is working very hard to overcome them so that these limitations aren't there in Dali 3 and uh, Dali 4. Um, yeah, the, these are just some of these other images. But also you would realize I have not shown you anything remotely close to any of these actual Philippe uh, Heber images. And I was never able to produce it. You can produce things that are technically like it, like they have spikes, but spikes that are nothing like this, or, you know, other features, you can see how in the image of a face, one of the eyes is off sitting, sitting in space, right? So it, it, 
um, was not ever able to create anything that looked remotely like these very, very distinctive uh, um, uh, creations of uh, Philippe. Um, yeah, so for instance, going from this uh, depiction of multitasking with the spikes, you can see it going here. So this is Dali's spike. It's nothing like Philippe's spikes, right? Absolutely nothing. And because Philippe is, is not a well-known artist, if you search on his name more than once or twice, the program will kick you out because you're not supposed to take just ordinary people and, and search on, on their name over and over. Um, yeah, just some more of that art. So, um, you know, it's, it's kind of an unresolved problem in my own uh, professional life. When, when you look at my website, just machines.com, there's a lot of this art there on the main first pages, right? And I realize a lot of important people will really be made uncomfortable by the art just to the same extent that I really like the art, you know? And, and whether that, oh, well, anyway, I haven't changed it. Um, and I have all these things I've written about Viva Les Spicules, even though he has not created them ever again since 2006, since that meeting where he told, told me that he wasn't doing them ever again. I still like the art. So what about things that are coming close to profound um, insights that Dali is giving me? I think when you really analyze them, they're kind of whatever you want to say, cool, interesting, you know, surprising, counterintuitive, but not profound, right? Not what you would expect from an entity that's remarkably smarter than you are. So let's take this image, what's funny about it is the presence of patina, right? That's something that occurs in, on copper surfaces. So if, if you make an etching or something or a statue that contains copper, over time, the surface turns green and um, art aficionados consider this to be very beautiful and you know, it's not a problem at all. It's something that you like when it happens. So th this is one of the few images I know of human faces showing, you know, patina. But so what? That that doesn't, <laughs> I don't think that's a real insight into the AGI future. It's just a sort of uh, thing that Dolly was able to do for me to get me thinking about something that I had not thought about before. And I don't really think it's that when humans and, and computers merge that our faces will be like that. No, I think this could actually be a depiction, not of two human faces, but of a picture of two human faces on a copper containing surface, right? So it's, it's that some artists drew and, and so, and, and, and that the uh, oxidate, oxidation of, of the copper turned it green. So maybe that's what, it, what it's a picture of, maybe Dolly never, never intended for it to be an actual picture of, of real human faces. What about this? So, a um, lot of things about it that are odd. It seems that the prompt seems to be about me and Vincent Van Gogh's style, but Van Gogh was misspelled. So um, Dali is very forgiving about uh, misspelled words and often knows what you mean. So it's given us not a picture of Kim Soles, but a picture of Vincent Van Gogh as if he was dealing with this issue 
of AGI utopia with improved human cooperation, truthfulness, and flourishing. Yeah. So you notice that there's this object, which is some sort of torch or I don't know, a way of holding something that, that, that emits light. Yeah, so that's part apparently of this uh, AGI utopia. Then you've got, got all these other objects over here you cannot identify, <laughs> presumably, or also clues to what AGI utopia are. But there are not really a lot of clues of what, what these other objects are. Yeah. So I, I would say once again that this is an interesting image, but it falls way short to the real insights that uh, AGI will actually provide when we have artificial general intelligence. This is maybe the most uh, insightful image thus far. Award-winning digital art, stained glass window, large language models, producing histology images from prompts and the post-scarcity future of transplantation. So you'll notice it has three things here. And I think this is a clock. This is a compass. This is a pressure gauge. I think this is a pressure valve of some sort, right? So isn't that kind of cool that it did all that? Yeah, but what's the big insight? <laughs> no really big insight, except that, well, you, you want to think about direction and time and like pressure, <laughs> I don't know, pressure release, yeah. Um, but it, it doesn't give you any clear message, right? Nothing you can act upon, nothing that, that you could really use to better predict what the, the post-AGI future would be like. Um, but still, it's a, it's a really cool image. I'm, I'm glad to have it. Um, now, I, I don't wanna spend much time on this because you, you guys don't know much about kidney pathology. But at the moment it is really bad at kidney pathology. The standard images of immunofluorescence, and this is its variation on immunofluorescence, but really there's almost nothing identifiable. It doesn't look the least bit like immunofluorescence. It, it, it's not very good at depicting tubules or glomeruli. Uh, yeah, there are a whole, whole bunch of things that we've all come to expect from kidney histology, which it cannot do at the moment. Um, and so let's think about radiology for a moment. Radiology is maybe a bit ahead of us. Why is that? Because standard radiographs are more likely to be in regular pictures. If Dolly is just using like the public internet images, you could probably find lots of uh, x-ray images there. And, and in fact, that, that's true. Like this, oh, this article, what does Dolly 2 know about radiology? Regular radiographs, regular x-rays, it seems to have a reasonable background of sort of what they're supposed to look like. Um, whereas the other higher end things, it, it isn't able to do. Um, so there, there, there's still many things in, in uh, diagnostic imaging that it's unable to do, but it, the, the starting point of just regular x-rays can do pretty well where it, it can't do uh, CT, MRI, ultrasound. But, you know, pathology, it, it doesn't really seem to have a clue what actual slides look like, what actual uh, histologic images look like. But I would imagine that that's coming. This is the CEO of um, OpenAI talking about the future. And what Sam Altman sees as the future 
is uh, medicine specific Dali um, with, as he says, a middle layer that tunes the model that make it the model for medicine with the data flywheel going on that improves over time. Yeah. Um, so I, I think uh, since there are already are large language models, at least a little bit in you know, pathology that eventually we will get to a point where later versions of uh, Dali will be able to do a much better job at going from text to um, actual uh, histology. Yeah, so that's the end of what I had to tell you. So let me stop sharing and see if you have, there we are. Yeah, so any questions? Um, you, you may all know this, but you know, Jacinta Specht is, is, is um, a very accomplished artist. So she probably had more feelings than the rest of you about, you know, the, uh, how the rights of the art artists are being uh, recognized or not in this process. Anyway, any, any, any comments, questions? Interrogation of Kim Solas begins now. Yeah. <laughs> Somebody. Um, yeah. I'll break the ice. Okay. Yeah. Good. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I. Uh, you mentioned that uh, if this um, uh, proposal application that you are working on is successful, you would have to produce a uh, video. A short that, video, right? yes, yes. Yeah. yeah. I, um... You're muted again. Oh, yeah. sorry. Yeah. Can you hear me now? Yes, yes. Okay. Yeah. I think uh, very recently there has been some like evolution on um, Dali like uh, tools. I think Meta uh, has worked on some text to video applications. That looks very cool. I think I can send a link to the chat. Yeah. Make Yes, yes, I, I, right. So what, what you're talking about is rather than going to still images, going to- uh, Directly movies. to video. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So and they've I, built upon the uh, already existing text to uh, image right. uh, training. Yeah, yeah. No, that's uh, really interesting. Yeah, I was aware of that, um, and it. Uh, of course. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, cool. All right. There we are. Yeah. But um, yeah, I I think one of the funny things about working in, in this area is you're always prepared if somebody says, "Well, what are your next steps? What are you going to do?" next you realize that what you've been doing in the last day or two already are substantial next steps because the the area is moving so quickly you know that 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 um like i think just going from the transplant world to all of uh medicine is is a kind of obvious step right that's much more interesting rather than staying in a single narrow uh, domain of, of thinking how this works in terms of, of changing all of medicine in some way. Um, yeah. So, you know, one of the most traumatic events in my life, it, it, it didn't happen to me directly, really, 
But um, so we, we were teaching the first year medical school class. Um, and Jonathan White, the surgeon, who's really one of our best teachers has won the 3M award. I just want, want you to realize he's a really good teacher, but even really good teachers make occasional errors. And so he said to the whole medical school class, you'll be out of a job, ha ha. <laughs> they got so mad. <laughs> I mean, they got really mad. This was maybe the wrong moment for them to have heard those words. And yeah, <laughs> so we, we really never recovered for, from that moment. And I, I think he was, he was wrong. I mean, I really see physicians as having interesting work lives for decades, centuries in the future, because there are lots of things even if AI is in charge, a lot of, a lot of things AI is going to need that physicians know how to do, you know, and, and, and so human enhancement and so on. All right. Okay. Yes. I unfortunately have a sore throat. Yeah. But I was wondering, mentioning examples of programs like DALI have strict parameters that bind them. Yeah. So, I guess, you know, be, being 76, <laughs> you probably can't imagine what, 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 what an aberration it would be to be 76 year, years of age. But it's kind of fun to be doing safe stuff. So one of the reasons that I enjoy using Dali, I think, is I know I'm unlikely to be creating harmful images because it, it's been working very, very hard on making sure people cannot create harmful images, right? So that may be the opposite of what you're thinking. You're thinking of all sorts of ways that this tech could be used to, you know, create things that other people would maybe not, not like. Yeah, so that's the way I look at it. And, like the thing I told you about that five day period, <clears throat> you would realize what I was experiencing was not anything open AI was doing, right? It was the way mail systems were reacting. It was not something that open AI did. It's just that they, their product was so successful that the mail systems felt that they had to reduce the number of, Dolly attachments being sent. So my behavior was different. A young person who was really irritated about this would have gone to their, the provider of their mail services and saying, why are you doing this? I'm sending a 1.9 meg attachment. You're giving me all this grief about it. Why don't you just let me send it, right? So. I wasn't bothered by it. I found it fascinating. And I wanted to get open, I, open AI's views on it. It wasn't that I was looking at them, them to fix it. As far as I was concerned, the longer this continued, the better a story it was for me, you know? I mean, five days was, was fine from that point of view. But yeah, so I think possibly my interests here and yours wouldn't be the same. You can easily find a program now that's cheaper, even though, you know, DALI is already quite cheap and would not have the same rules. Like some of the programs you can take any famous person and search for that, for images of, of that famous person, which you know, Dolly will not uh, allow you to do. So it isn't that the rules are a problem. The rules are keeping Kim Soles comfortable where I, I can work with Dolly for hours and hours and not feel guilty, right? <laughs> not feel ashamed, right? And, and that it, for me is sort of good. So yeah, so um, that's how I, look on it and then, and then 
they've gotten very, very good at this. So uh, originally there were many more rules that, than there are now. You couldn't do anything with human faces. You, you couldn't search, search on your own name. And now all that has changed. Yeah, so, so there are fewer images, fewer limitations. Um, no, I, I don't think the, the, the story isn't how it's hindering the, the progress. The story is how rapid the progress is now that there are virtually no barriers to people using this. And there are many other programs. If, if they don't like this one, they, they can find uh, others. Yeah. So one of the things, if, if you become really interested in my professional career, people are trying to please me by in scientific sessions where I'm there or, or, or in charge of or, or something, they're showing Dolly images, but in a fashion where there's no attempt to be beautiful or colorful or happy or anything, or all those various adjectives like award-winning, you know, blah, blah. that's not there. So they come back with just a straight image that meets the intentions of the prompt but it's not particularly appealing. And, and of course, that's, that's fine, but it's just, I'm getting used to more and more beautiful images every day, you know, happy images and ones that sort of promote human flourishing and stuff, stuff like that. So unbeknownst to these people who are trying to please me by just showing Dolly images, my requirements for what a good image is because the, the bar gets higher and higher every day as, as my own images uh, improve. Yeah. Other questions? So we're, we're writing an article for the New England Journal of Medicine, the best uh, journal in Madison. Does this seem like a subject interesting enough for the best journal or do you think it's sort of blah? <laughs> you, you're having a hard time staying awake thinking about it or, or do you find it exciting or somewhere in, in between, where does it, fit in the great scheme of things in the universe, do you think? I would think this is super interesting and cutting edge because I don't think a lot of people, like you said, are talking about it besides like the fear in radiology about how <laughs> machines are just going to take over all yeah. the radiologist jobs, <laughs> So, which I think is a little short-sighted and um, unfounded. I think there's a lot of fear mongering that happens too. But I think it's also a far ways off. And I think having like an article early about this, even just like for pathology and stuff like that is important. So, yeah. 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 No, what I felt about students in general and, you know, medical students also, having more pride in what you are, who you are, and, and so on has always made sense. I mean, the, the sort of medical student imposter syndrome, which is a common thing or early on that you think you got in by accident, you're the stupidest person in the room and stuff. The opposite side of it, of how interesting a person you are, that's why you got, in, got into medical school. And so you should keep enhancing that and you can. You know, I mean, I, I haven't given up anything and, and I, I've had great fun in my medical career, you know, all 50 some years of it. So um, it, it's, it's important not to think of yourself as mundane and ordinary because when you start to think of yourself as mundane and ordinary, then the future is really scary because 
<laughs> if you are indeed mundane and ordinary, then probably machines can do everything you do better than you, you can, and, right? But that's, that's probably not true of you or anybody that you know. I mean, humans in general and, and medical students and U of A students in particular are remarkably interesting and <laughs> just gotta work on, 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 on enhancing that stuff. It makes you such a singular individual, you know, and you think about what does the singularity mean? Dr. Solis thinks it's about AGI, but I think it's about me. It's about me. <laughs> I'm it, you know? Yeah, no, that's, that's good too. Yeah, that can be another meaning for it, right? So, yeah. So, um, and I think it, it, it's maybe a good moment to, to, to kind of reflect why were the medical students so mad uh, about um, jo Jonathan White saying, you'll, you'll be out of a job. Well, it, it's this fear that maybe what I'm doing is ordinary, right? That, that you know, I, I expect <laughs> medicine to be more special and I expected me myself to be more special and neither medicine is special nor me. And, now I'm in deep trouble because AI is going to take over. And yeah. So, I mean, that, that's not correct. That isn't what's going to happen. There are going to be a whole lot of new challenges in human society. And probably people just like the three of you are exactly the right people to help solve them, you know. And, and it's going to be very satisfying to do so and so on. So, yeah. I just think that's the future you you have to look forward to. Yeah. I think another reason why this article is important to write to is that I feel like the people who are most scared about the AI takeover are like the ones who don't understand it the most or the least educated about why it might be helpful and not uh just like take over all our jobs because that's that's the people who I talk to who are like oh don't go into radiology or don't do this because AI is going to take over I'm like if you stepped into a lab and understood any AI you would understand that that's not going to happen but okay yeah. yeah no I think it it's a wonderful sin symbiosis if you think about the pleasure you get from meeting somebody new there are going to be a lot of somebody news who are not human, right? That you're going to meet in the in the future, and and it's going to be great, you know. Not only for you, but for them, right? They're looking for what you have. They don't know enough about nature and this biology thing, and they want to know about it from you, and you want to know about them. Yeah. So I mean, the world is 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 really opening up in in an amazing way, you know. And, and so there's a thing I, I, I talk about, there is no limit to how big you can think. So maybe internally think, oh, that's wrong. But anyway, maybe for you there are, but even so within those limits, it's fun to think, well, you know, how good could the world get? How, how important a role could I play in that? You know, yeah, that, that's, that's all very, very exciting stuff. So, so I, uh, the, the class period goes to 320. So we have 10 more minutes. I realize you haven't had very many class periods with me, but anyway, thanks for putting up with, with this very unusual term of the course. And no, I'm, I'm very proud. I mean, just think of it simply. I plan to cancel the course for this term because I was doing other things. And the students, including students right here today, <laughs> convinced me to, to keep, keep the course going anyway. And that's what we did. And this is what we, what we ended up with, which isn't bad, right? So you can think of huge courses. Like last year, there were times when we had 25 medical students uh, taking the course at a time, you know, 50 for the year.
but they would sort of generally assign one medical student to actually show up. So that actually made it way better because would you have wanted, like would, would the undergraduates have wanted to be diluted by 25 medical students? No. But, you know, we had the video, we had the one, one or two people who were actually there. And yeah, it all worked great. So I, I think that, that there's something quaint and nice about the course with so few students where, where the intellectual ferment still works. And yeah, so I, don't know, I think hopefully that's, that's what you're getting. And if you think about the other simple thing, the most out there ideas I talk about and that you're learning about from me this term will obviously be not be on the midterm, right? So you're not being tested on them. But isn't that the way life is anyway? <laughs> the most important lessons that you learn, the things that have huge survival value, you didn't have any test on them either. You know, so, so, so a lot of the, the most valuable things you learn, you're not learning them because of the test, you're learning them because of life, right? Life requires this. It's not that it's going to be on the test. Yeah. So, so anyway, and I, I should also tell you something. I, I tell every group of students, I know this sounds like something that I should have gone to jail for a long time ago, but I never did. And it looks like I don't know. it's not going to happen. On the midterm, we scale the grades. And sometimes we scale the grades a lot. Like, let's say we, we give a midterm and the lowest grade on an absolute scale is like 12 and the highest grade is like 95. So we then move everybody up. So we move the 95 to 99 and the 12 up to something like 83, you know, sort of B minus kind of thing. Yeah. And, 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 and we've been doing that for a long time. And, and I didn't get any, any scary calls in the night. <laughs> Dr. Sola is like, bad news for you. And here you've been scaling the grades in your class. And yeah, yeah, no, that, that hasn't, hasn't happened. And what about the students who get the lowest grade in this class? You would think, first of all, they're selected, right? Most students, um, they, they really don't understand what this course is about anyway, or why would you ever take a course that's not required? It's like about the long range future and, you know. But so some of the most reliable people helping me with future iterations of the course have been the people who got the lowest grade <laughs> in, the, in the term that they took the course. Isn't that cool? That they enjoyed it so much. And, and some of them are people who, who are really here to, to enjoy the experience of, of being here. They're not trying to get A's all the time, B's for them, the perfectly good grade. And when they get a B or, you know, B minus, may not occur to them. That's the lowest grade in the course. For them, that's, that's what they usually get. It's fine. So there's actually no relationship between students coming back term after term to help me with various aspects of the course and how they actually performed in the course. And, and that's also sort of cool. So anyway, I, I just wanted, I wanted the two of you to be actually taking the midterm, not to um, spend too many wake wakeless nights worrying about taking an exam that was actually created for the previous term of the course, and your term is so different. And yeah, what? But anyway, so so the worst could that could happen to you isn't very bad. And most of the uh, drama around grades has been around A versus A plus. Somebody who has a friend who got an A plus and they get an A, they got so upset. <laughs> like, Look, here are the clusters, right? So I'm not gonna tell you who this is, but 
here are you, you're, you're in this cluster and here are the people who got A plus and there's a space between them. <laughs> you clearly should not get an A plus, but don't you know how good a grade A is? I mean, <laughs> so usually they leave that conversation happy, you know, they're not like going away mad. <laughs> yeah. We have had occasional students who just coast, but they they pass. If if you don't really do anything, you're bound to do something, not just because of the people teaching the course, but the other students are so interesting that you can't just sit there like a lump on a log and do nothing when other students are so charismatic and outgoing and, 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 and you know, invigorated by, by, by the course. So you're bound to accidentally learn something even if your intention was, was to do nothing. So like the lowest grade we ever had is like C plus and, and, and those are students who probably, you know, intended to just kind of coast and, and that happens less, less and less. Yeah. So anyway, uh, yeah. Any, any other questions? We have three minutes before the end of the class period. Yeah. Anything for the last three minutes? Anyway, thanks for putting up with this. I mean, what, what you're really doing is allowing me to add students to a lot of what otherwise would be like solitary Kim Sola's experiences, right? So anyway, I I appreciate that. So okay, yeah. Well, great. Yeah. So I, I have a first year medical student coming to see me on Thursday. And uh so there's a medical student's desk in my office and I'm gonna show him the desk, uh, tell him the stories of all, all the other medical students who have been at that desk. We, we, we did that throughout the, the pandemic, you know, where shadowing was outlawed. So we decided that we didn't know what it was to assume that that desk was doing but it's not shadowing whatever <laughs> no shadows if you look there's no shadows being created so no shadowing yeah so so anyway that also you would think i would have gone to jail for that and i didn't yeah so i i've escaped a lot of uh, yeah enforcement yeah okay well thank you very much for joining today and do i think there'll be other sessions before the end of the course i think so because stuff happens that it makes sense to share 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 with you and so anyway yeah thank you for joining and i'll be in touch okay great bye-bye so much thank you